Tonight's reading is taken from Mark, chapter 9, verses 1 to 12, the Transfiguration. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, they were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we give you our praise and glorify your name. As we study your words, would you guide us, teach us, open our hearts and minds to see the truth of your words. For this, Lord, we thank you. Amen. In case you don't know me, I think most people do. I'm, my name's Norma. When you were small, did your parents guide you and instruct you? I know mine did, or they tried to. And now I've tried to do that with my children and my grandchildren. Along the way, I believe I've been transformed into a more patient parent. There were light bulb moments when I suddenly understood how my own parents were and their words of wisdom. I understood them so much more. How I wish I'd had hindsight so I could understand what they were trying to teach me. There are many times whilst reading the Bible where I feel sorry for the disciples, knowing that we have the whole Bible to make sense of it all. Just a few days after telling the disciples of his impending death, where they are crippled by the mere idea of what will happen, it appears that Jesus seeks to provide an inspirational lesson where God condescends to give him that physical glory just to reinforce the disciples' faith. Jesus took the three men up the mountain. It is believed to be Mount Tabor. Mountains were often associated with closeness to God and readiness to receive his word. God had appeared on mountains to both Moses in Exodus and Elijah in Kings. Jesus clearly knew what was about to happen on the mountain. But what did he mean when he said, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. 
we, all of us, know that God established his kingdom after Jesus' resurrection. Which is why Jesus could say there were people there who would still be alive. Because it's not happened yet, but would very soon. In the transfiguration, Peter, James and John were about to see Christ's glory, which was normally hidden under his humanity. This is so that they can face his death in a more positive way. I think for a lot of people, if you've nursed someone in your family and they've, they've got cancer and they know that they're dying of cancer, you live with that. And you try to be positive about the route that you're going to take. So this is about creating um, some kind of positivity for the disciples. The question that's often asked is, why take those three, Peter, James and John? Well, it could be that Jesus just think these, thinks that these three are ready to receive the word, that it's revealed to them that they will understand it. And it tells us, as, as they watched, Jesus' appearance was completely transformed. His clothes were radiantly white. His um, face was dazzling this is indescribable to the men a manifestation of light and glory which will be Jesus when he reigns as king in the days to come just for a moment Jesus is seen as his true self the disciples see him in all his glory this reinforced the staggering faith of these apostles this must be very frightening to the men. It's hard for us to imagine clothes that are whiter than white, that shine. And when Moses and Elijah appear, talking to Jesus, what a sight that must have been for these disciples, who had already seen so much. How did they recognise Moses and Elijah? Because don't forget, they didn't have any photographs at that time, didn't have any social media, they didn't look on Facebook. It might have been that overhearing some of the conversation that they actually picked up on who they were, but it's more likely that God decided to reveal that to them, that this was prompted by the Holy Spirit. The setting on the mountain is a pivotal moment and it is presented as the point where human nature meets God, the meeting place of the temporal and the eternal, with Jesus himself as the connecting point, acting as a bridge between heaven and earth, a time when all three persons of the Trinity are there. God the Father speaks from heaven God the Son was the one being transfigured and God the Holy Spirit is ministering amongst them. Why does he meet with Moses and Elijah? This symbolises that Jesus is their successor and is fulfilled both. He is now bringing a new covenant from God for all people. When God's voice is heard, he is reassuring the disciples that even though Jesus must suffer, they must listen to him and obey him. Peter exclaims, let us put up three tents, one for Moses, one for Elijah and one for Jesus. He didn't know what to say or do. He's terrified, really. And so would we have been. How shocked and confused would we be? The transfiguration revealed Jesus' divine nature. God's voice exalted Jesus above Moses and Elijah as the long-awaited Messiah with full divine authority. Moses represented the law and Elijah the prophets. Their appearance showed Jesus as the fulfillment of both the Old Testament law and the prophetic promises. 
Jesus was not a reincarnation of Elijah or Moses. He was not merely one of the prophets. As God's only son, he far surpasses them in authority and power. Many voices try to tell us how to live and how to know God personally. Some of these are helpful, but many are not. We must first listen to the Bible and then evaluate all of our authorities in light of God's revelation. The Transfiguration is an event in Jesus' life in which his appearance was radiantly transformed. This is recorded in each of the Synoptic Gospels. It must have been frightening and overpowering when the cloud overshadowed them and the voice from the heaven proclaimed, this is my dearly loved son in whom I, my well-loved son, listen to him. Wow. We can't imagine that happening. Then as suddenly as it came, the cloud's gone and so were on Moses and Elijah. And all they could see was Jesus. They must have wondered if they'd gone to sleep, whether they'd imagined it in their sleepy state, or whether, you know, they'd just had some kind of hallucination. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus tells them not to tell anyone. Because he understands that they won't understand what's happening until he has risen from the dead. Then they would realize that only through dying could Jesus show his power over death and his authority to be king of all. The disciples would not be powerful witnesses for God until they had grasped this truth. It was natural for the disciples to be confused by Jesus' death and resurrection because they could not see into the future. We, on the other hand, have God's revealed word in the Bible to give us full meaning of Jesus' death and resurrection. We have no excuse for unbelief. So the disciples kept it to themselves for now as they respected Jesus' instruction. They couldn't discuss it with others, yet they must have asked each other what it meant rising from the dead. Could you imagine not discussing it with the other apostles? To understand their thoughts, we would have to think as James, John and Peter did in those days before Jesus was crucified and resurrected. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Then they asked him, why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? When Jesus said Elijah had already come, he was speaking, of course, of John the Baptist, who had fulfilled the role prophesied for Elijah. It was difficult for the disciples to grasp the idea that their Messiah would have to suffer. The Jews who studied the Old Testament prophecies expected the Messiah to be a great king like David who would overthrow the enemy, which was Rome. Their vision was limited to their own time and experience. They did not understand that the values of God's eternal kingdom are different from the values of the world. They wanted relief from their pe present problems, but deliverance from sin is far more important than deliverance from physical suffering or political, political oppression. Our understanding and, and appreciation of Jesus must go beyond what we can do, what he can do for us in the here and now, it is our eternal life we should be concerned with. The here and now is all what the world promises and all what the world would have us believe. While we know the truth, 
Eternity is promised to those who follow Christ. My first thoughts when I think about the transfiguration are mixed. I feel a comparison with when I encountered the Holy Spirit as I asked Jesus to come into my life to forgive me and make me clean again. That sense of fire burning inside. I believe that I was a new creation, acceptable to God. There are times when I see that white glowing light changing me and making me whole again. Then there are times when I see that I need to keep asking for forgiveness. I need to renew and cleanse myself with each passing day. There are times when I feel light and free, able to powerfully praise my Father God for all he has done, and times when I feel the blackness, the darkness of the world in which we live, chasing me, trying to pull me into the blackness, into the void of our world. There are times when I despair at the sin around me. I fear for my family, who appear at times far from God. I call on God to transform me in his image. Paul says in Romans 12, 1 to 2, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I don't know how many of you know, but today is St George's Day. He was a Roman soldier who refused to recant his Christian faith and persecute other Christians. I suppose most people remember the story of him slaying the dragon, but it's highly unlikely that he did fight a dragon, and for that matter, that he ever visited England. King Edward III made him the patron saint of England when he formed the Order of the Garter in St George's name in 1350. And the cult of the saint was further advanced by King Henry V at the Battle of Agincourt in northern France, when King Henry called his name as part of a battle cry. Sadly, St George was tortured and beheaded for refusing to recant his faith in Christ. St George was an ordinary man who was transformed because of his faith venerated for protecting and defending the weak. Today, many people are completing the London Marathon. Well, they'll have finished now, or there might be a few like me that are still going. It'll be a long time. Some will be doing it for the first time. All of them are doing it for a reason. Maybe their own illness, maybe a family member's illness, or maybe a worthy charity, or in memory of someone who's died. All of them are open for some type of transformation when they finish. The truth is, for them, it may be nothing to do with faith, but I think we can agree that God gives them the strength of body and mind to complete the race. God was the reason they started the race, and God will be the reason they finish the race. For many of those racing, they just don't know God yet. And it's up to me and you to make sure that at some stage, very soon they do. Do you believe that you are good enough? I have moments of doubt where I feel that I'm just not good enough, that I don't understand why God would love me. When I look at myself and think, I could do so much more, I don't do enough. Having been born again, do you believe that you are transformed? 
If I told you that God transforms all who call on his name, no matter what their past, no matter what sins they have committed, we, have been li- we can be likened to the caterpillar that goes through complete metaphor- metamorphosis until it emerges as a butterfly. Sarah spoke this morning about the word sin. We dislike it. But the truth is, we do things wrong. We need to recognize, recognize those things as sin. If not, how can we ask God for forgiveness? God can transform us completely. He made each of us in it, his own image. Sometimes that's odd to understand, especially when a person has a disability or an illness. I'm going to read a poem to you. It's written by a Nigerian young man. And if I say his name right, it'll be a miracle. Babaranti Tobila Oba Joshua. Now, I'd want to put it the other way around and just say Joshua something, but he's actually called the names that way. Transfiguration on the Mount. It was time for the meat but he would never walk alone. Except with his father, he must be. Took with him three of his best friends, so mortals could bear witness to the glory that awaits at the end. Family did not reverence him. Friends did not believe him. People only saw another man. A prophet, perhaps, but nothing more. Say, what different is he from those before him? He is flesh and blood, just like the rest of us. If if he was born out of royalty, then maybe he truly is a king. But he came out of Nazareth, born in the dark and in a manger. But the Son of Man never shifted his gaze away from the awaiting glory. A glory so bright and everlasting that only in death it could be re- it could be revealed the son of man was then seen here on earth standing with saints moses elijah powerful men of old one had water obey his voice the other fire runs and does his bidding how on earth could this be The three friends thought to themselves, this cannot be a mere mortal. We truly have wined and dined with none but God himself. We're now going to play a video um, that reminds me that with God, transformation is possible for everyone. This, This little boy is now a young man. His story is continuing. You can see God's work in his life, real transformation, which shows us that transformation is possible for all of us. I'll just finish with a prayer. Lord, we lift your name on high because we know that through you, our transformation will be complete as long as we closely follow you. When we are broken and damaged, You change and complete us until our transformation is complete. For this, Lord, we praise your name. With the heavenly angels, we give you glory. Thank you, Father. Amen.